Welcome to Tell Me, AAC for the Preschool Classroom. Sotillo is honored and excited to have Dr. Carol Zangari presenting as our guest today. My name is Lisa Tim and I will be your facilitator today. Dr. Zangari is an associate professor at Nova Southeastern University where she teaches masters and doctoral classes in AAC. She coordinates the AAC Language Lab and provides clinical supervision to graduate student clinicians. She is a frequent presenter on AAC topics at international and national conferences. Dr. Zangari co-edited Practically Speaking Language, Literacy and Academic Development for Students with AAC Needs with Gloria Soto and co-authored Tell Me AAC in the Preschool Classroom with Lori Wise. She blogs at practicalaac.org. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. This presentation is being recorded and will be stored on the Sotilla website and our YouTube channel. Everyone is muted to cut back on feedback and disruptions. If we do happen to unmute you at any time, you would be able to control your uh, mute and unmute with this button here. Please use the chat window to type in any questions. I will monitor the chat window when I'm not speaking and alert Dr. Zangari for any questions. We will hold the questions until the end of the presentation. If we are unable to address all questions at the end, we will compile them and send answers and responses to the attending group. Finally, if you did not do so already, you can download your materials for today's training in the materials section. This will include the ASHA participants participation form and instructions. In compliance with ASHA, we have the following disclosures. Dr. Zangari is a co-author of Tell Me, which is published by Attainment. As a co-author, she receives royalties for the program. Dr. Zangari does not have any financial relationships with Sotillo. She is the owner and author at the Practical AAC blog website. One more thing about uh, ASHA submission, you must stay on the entire presentation and you will want to submit your participation forms within 15 days of this uh, training. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Zangari now. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Can everybody see the screen okay? Terrific. Well, thank you so much, um, and welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. I so appreciate the invitation to talk about Tell Me, uh, a project that has been a long time in the making. Um, before we, let's see. I can get this to pop right there. There we go. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'd certainly like to acknowledge my co-author and value colleague, uh, Lori Wise, without whom this project would never have come to fruition. Uh, so Lori's background as a special education teacher um, with expertise in reading and in autism, it was a wonderful sort of complement to my own background in speech language pathology. And um, the fact that she spent many years in the classroom and is a wonderful mentor of teachers, um, really allowed us to get to ideas that work in real classrooms. Uh, in addition, I, I'd certainly like to acknowledge the many individuals who played a role in the development of this work and its field testing, uh, along with the individuals and companies who've supported this work by allowing us to use their symbols and things like that. I, I think one of the most gratifying things about working on the project has really been the generosity and the collegiality of so many people uh, um, across the country. So deeply grateful to all of them and also to uh, Attainment, our publisher, um, and to Sotillo for inviting me here um, today. So before I get into the specifics of the Tell Me program, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we got here and kind of why we think this kind of program will make a, a contribution. And as many of you know all too well, when little children with disabilities arrive at preschool and they don't yet have an effective means of communication and they don't yet have a well-functioning AAC system in place, 
we often have that kind of mad scramble to try to develop or select or refine an augmentative communication tool that allows them to do three basic things. Communicate functionally, further develop their language, and learn about the world. So as quickly as possible, we're scrambling to put an AAC system in place that once they get good at that AAC system will allow them to tell about what they're thinking, to grow their language, and to grow their world knowledge. So in my experience, the AAC tools that do that generally have these four elements, a set of um, frequently used words, high frequency words that we often call core vocabulary, specific but important words that may be personal core to a particular child, like maybe the name of a brother or sister or whatever they call their treasured blankie, right? Or they could be fringe words that are maybe more specific to a particular experience, like a meal, an art activity, going to the playground, right? So they have those. They also have some phrases and sentences that maybe let a child quickly express things that they don't really have the ability to say if they had to put that sentence together word by word. So it might be something they need to say quickly, like, ah, get me out of my wheelchair, or hey, wait, don't forget about me, or even just, what is that? Right? It could even be things like maybe a repeated line from a song or a story or part of a chant or a saying that's recited as a group in a preschool class. So they have access to those kinds of um, whole messages. And finally, alphabet access, not because, of course, they read yet, right, or we expect them to read if they're four years old, but because they're going to be learning about reading and writing. And hey, if that's going to be a goal, it sure is helpful to have access to the letters of the the alphabet in order to do that. So I'd like you to think about the preschoolers you know who have significant communication challenges who would benefit from AAC or have it, and reflect on the AAC systems that they have in, in terms of how they address these areas. Um, so let's look at one example of a robust system that, that uh, contains these sorts of elements. So here's an image of a main screen I think a lot of you recognize. It's a main screen of WordPower. It's a popular AAC page set that's available in um, AAC apps and in some traditional speech generating devices. And this particular version um, is WordPower 60 Basic, and the developer, um, an amazing speech language pathologist, Nancy Inman, created for preschoolers and others who are maybe newer to AAC but still need a lot of language. So as we look at this AAC tool, we start to see how some of the elements we just spoke about get represented, right? So there are lots of frequently used words here, that core vocabulary, and we can kind of see where there are places where we'd find more specific words, like different places or maybe different categories or groups of words. We can see that there's um, a place where we can go for alphabet access. And with some imagination, we can kind of see where there might be some phrases and sentences and questions that allow them to participate in an activity with their peers, even if they lack the language skills to put, to put together phrases and sentences like, happy birthday, or I'm four years old, right? So now this is the full version, and we'd probably start with a much simpler version at the beginning of the school year, and then gradually add in or reveal more and more of the words until it looks like this. But I always feel like we have to start with the end uh, in sight in order for us to be really efficient with these kids and avoid a lot of course corrections or changes in direction in terms of their AAC system as the language skills develop. So please don't think I'm saying that this is the best starting point for all kids with AAC needs. Certainly not. But I do think that we do more harm to kids by restricting their vocabularies than by providing them with a fuller array of words to learn. So having a language-rich AAC system is a start, for sure, right? Giving our nonverbal or minimally verbal preschoolers access to an AAC tool, whether it's a communication board or a book or a speech generating device or an AAC app, giving them access to AAC tools with those elements really just puts us at the starting line, doesn't it? It kind of gets us ready to go. But in order for them to develop any reasonable degree of proficiency 
with their AAC, they're certainly going to need our support, right? They need an environment that supports them in key ways, right? Those being things like high expectations, lots of aided language input where the adults are modeling AAC as they speak, engaging activities and materials, frequent opportunities for communication, responsive communication partners, right? They need those things. And the vast majority of them are going to need one more thing and that's instruction, right? They need us to teach them to learn um, how to use this AAC tool to express themselves, right? And so when given a robust system, teachers and therapists generally don't have too much trouble teaching words like pretzels or yogurt, right? They don't have problems, for the most part, teaching words that are concrete, like cat and mouth, right? And they're probably not going to have a terrible time teaching a kid to hit a single button to say a whole phrase like the weather is or today is if these are things that get routinely used in circle time or their morning meeting. Kids will get that based on where they um, are located in the app or the device or the tool. But teachers and therapists do tell us that they struggle with many of these high-frequency words that we all have called core vocabulary. And those of you who've held a four-year-old in your lap or sat on a carpet square next to them to try to teach these things know what I'm talking about, right? Teaching abstract words to kids who may be at a very concrete level is very tricky. We really struggle in figuring out how we're going to teach these kinds of words, right? And that's a problem, it's a shame, because these are some of the words that kids need to say all day long, no matter whom they're with or what they're doing. And these examples I just put in uh, yesterday, uh, they came from an experience I had earlier this week. They came from a little guy who speaks, he's four years old and he has autism. And while I was chatting with some people near his preschool, here's some of the things I overheard him say. Right? So no doubt, kids and kids with disabilities need these words. They use them all day long. But think about how challenging it is for us as teachers or SLPs to really teach them to kids with little or no functional speech, and they're learning to use an AAC system. So if you've ever tried to teach a word like do or put or really or can, you know that it can be perplexing. How am I going to explain to a kid who has significant language challenges what the word can means or it or that, right? So lots of very smart teachers and therapists struggle with this. They know that kids need these words. They know they should teach them, but the how? Not so much, right? That's where we all get tripped up. And that's where they tell us they need um, some guidance um, and ideas. And so, in a nutshell, albeit probably a very big nut, in a nutshell, that's why Lori Wise and I developed Tell Me, to make it easier for therapists and educators to teach these high-frequency words as core vocabulary to young children with significant communication challenges. So Tell Me has a printed manual with kind of the general concepts and procedures spelled out and also an example of how to apply these general procedures to a specific story. That kind of is what comes in the book, the shrink wrap book, right? But it also comes with a flash drive, and I love how Attainment creatively kind of displays this as a business card that kind of pops open there. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that flash drive, give me one second, Sorry, I have to keep hydrating myself because my office is right down from the voice lab <clears throat> and I live in fear of the fact that they might want to scope me without anesthesia. <laughs> so um, the flash drive, as I was saying, contains over 80% of the Tell Me content, right? It contains the files for implementing Tell Me with about 11 different books. So uh, you want to pay attention to that. Okay, so as I talk about what's in there, what's in that book, what's on that flash drive, and why it's structured the way it is, here's some things to keep in mind, right? We developed Tell Me to address a few problems, right? One being that there are too few SLPs who are comfortable with AAC, and those of us who are around have too little time with these students, right? Meanwhile, Preschool teachers probably got little or no AAC preparation 
when they were in their training programs, right, and got everything they know about AAC on their own, right, from the experience of trying different things and collaborating, from conferences, workshops, from webinars like this one. And it's a great effort on their part, but probably not as much AAC background as they want and need, right? So the end result of all this is that there are far too many children entering preschool, uh, entering kindergarten, without that foundation of basic language, even if they have a good AAC uh, app or speech generating device. So kind of given those problems, those limitations, we set out to see what role we could play, how we could make AAC and language learning part of an entire preschool day, not just when the SLP pushes in, not just at snack time, but all day long, right? It's our belief that teachers really want to do what works best for their kids, right? They didn't go into this to get rich for sure. They didn't go into this because they wanted easy work, right? They love seeing these kids grow and develop. They relish the opportunity to hasten that growth. But when it comes to teaching kids with very little um, functional language, it certainly feels overwhelming. So we developed Tell Me as a classroom-based approach to teaching these high-frequency words, right? We build it around the repeated reading of familiar stories, right? And we designed it so it could be used with any AAC system that has core vocabulary in it. Right, it is not specific to a particular speech generating device or symbol type or app. I used one example to get us started um, today, but the whole point, the whole reason that uh, we designed it the way that we did is because you have diverse learners. They use different kinds of AAC systems, and it should work with any of them as long as it has core vocabulary. It's also not a, uh, a full curriculum that will cover the entire year, and I'll explain more about that in a little bit. So here are the four components of the Tell Me program, uh, and we'll be talking about each one in more detail as we move on. Shared reading, shared writing, which are group experiences, and then your classroom uh, centers, activities, and routines, and um, outreach to the parents for home extension. So in our experience, um, Tell Me has been supportive for a wider range of children, but it's really mostly designed for these kinds of kids, right? Those that are minimally verbal or fully nonverbal. Those who are using or we know will need to use, predict will need to use, an augmentative and alternative um, communication tool, an AAC tool, that includes these high frequency words, and some kids that can speak but rarely do, right? So those very reluctant communicators, a dose of poor vocabulary may be a nice bridge for those guys to get more confidence in using their spoken language. So Tell Me is based on the repeated reading of these 11 books, right? Two each, excuse me, two weeks for each book, and a set of four to six high frequency or core words for each book, along with the specific letter, letter of the alphabet that we target in each book, right? So 11 books times two weeks per book means that if you implement Tell Me every day in your preschool classroom, it's going to cover 11 weeks. Right? And over that time, if you did all the words, you'd be covering about, what, maybe 62 words, right? Not a lot, but we controlled the number of words for some of the same reasons that we created material for only 22 re weeks, and that's this. The whole point of Tell Me is to help teachers, therapists, and paraprofessionals develop good AAC teaching practices and routines, right? We've structured it, it as much for the benefit of the adult learning as we have for the kids learning, right? There are plenty of smart and hardworking teachers and therapists out there. And Tell Me is really set up so that once you go through the 11 books worth of material we created for, uh, you know, with your preschool class, you should well be able to continue that same quality and quantity of core vocabulary instructions with your own books, right? With words that you choose to focus on. So really, this is an approach that fe favors teaching people to fish rather than, fe than feeding them one fish at a time. And I hope that kind of makes sense. So the idea 
um, is that we built this on repetition with variety, not just for kids, but for us as interventionists, right? Kids learn best when we're good at teaching a particular thing, right? Agreed? But do you know how long it takes to get good at teaching AAC systems with the four characteristics that we talked about earlier? It takes a long time, right? And the best way we know to help ourselves and our colleagues across the country develop this proficiency is to provide clear guidance and to give them a chance to implement it over and over so that they get, can get more comfortable, more fluent, and more automatic with these tools and strategies. So each of the 11 books, as I said, has four to six target words and a letter of the alphabet, and we stay with each book and, um, and set of words and each letter for two weeks and then move on to the next one. So in a minute, we'll start looking more specifically at the four components of Tell Me, but first I just wanted to do a quick reminder, right, about particularly about core vocabulary. So Tell Me is not a prescription for what words to teach kids in a developmental sequence for any individual child, right? We know better than that. Kids are so different from one another. Um, they certainly deserve someone who's knowledgeable about language development, about AEC, to look carefully about their specific needs, right, and help the team make decisions based on that set of information. So some kids may come to your preschool ready for a grid layout um, AEC system. Others may need visual scenes, right? Some are still learning about the power of communication, right? So we're at a different starting place. Tell Me really helps teachers, educational assistants, and therapists who are wanting to implement core vocabulary teaching with their students, right? But it is really up to that student's team to decide whether that's appropriate for an individual child, and if so, what AAC tools are best suited uh, to that child's needs. So let's dig in and get started with a closer look at the four main components of Tell Me. And we'll start with shared reading. Shared reading is a group activity in which we look at the same book for two weeks and use it to give children receptive and expressive experience with that set um, of four to six words. So in shared reading, a teacher or a therapist, if she's pushing in and doing the activity, explicitly models the strategies and skills that proficient readers use. And in Tell Me, we use it because it also explicitly models how proficient language users talk using AAC. So shared reading is very interactive, right? We read together to explore the book and discuss it, enjoy the story. We notice things as we read. We talk about them. And in Tell Me, this happens in a very predictable format. In each of the 10 lessons for every book, there are three parts. Pre-reading activities to get us ready for our book, right, our story. Um, get ready to communicate about our story. Actual reading, the story itself. Follow-up activities that help us better process the elements of the story and use our new shared um, uh, words. Um, and get experience with letters and text and concepts of print. So every day we do shared reading, and each day has these three elements. But what we do in each element does have some variability, right? But overall, a lesson one in book one has the exact same structure and procedures as lesson one in book eight, or book nine, or book ten. And lesson two looks the same no matter which book. The words are changing and the book is changing, but the procedures stay the same, right? So the structure and the predictability is what makes it easier for teachers and therapists to become better and better uh, in their implementation. But through it all, we try very hard to keep our eyes on our prize. What we're really trying to do here in these 10 lessons of shared reading in the 11 books is to try to help kids get better and better at using those high-frequency words in their AAC systems. So we don't have a ton of time for me to get into um, all of the intervention strategies that are embedded in these lessons, uh, but I will say that they're engineered to give a lot of AEC input and get a lot of AEC output with the four to six core words that are associated with the book, 
right? We are saying them often. In fact, very often. So often that a naive observer would probably think it's a little strange that the teacher has made it a point to say a word like can or like so often when she's reading and talking with her kids um, during this reading, right? But that's what focused language stimulation is. Right? We also do a little bit of warm up in the before reading segment, right? Before we get into the reading and talking about the story, we all say the target word together as a group. So let's get ready to say our special words. Jason, I like how you're sitting. Oh, Maya's ready. Miss Jessica, can you get Braden's communication board where he can reach it? Right? And then we're moving on. Okay, let's all say like. And we help the little kids say like however they can, right? and give them feedback. Okay, yay, great job, Hawks Landing Super Hawks. You did it, right? Now everybody say can, right? And we help them do that. So why do we have this sort of decontextualized rote call and response part of our before reading activity? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but one is that it's kind of an alerting mechanism, right? It wakes up our reticular activating system, the RAS in our brains, and that helps us figure out what we should pay attention to in life and what we should ignore, right? And it gives our brain kind of a heads up that these are important words to pay attention to. And it also gives our little AAC users a bit of a warm up with their motor plan. Because in doing this without the distraction of story and character and plot, it lets us focus on the symbol for that word, right, what that looks like, where it is in the AC tool, and how to get our bodies to use the AEC um, to say the word. So think of this kind of choral responding, kind of like stretching before a run, or maybe like a, a, if glancing at a list of parent names before the back to school night festivities begin, right? It just really helps us to prepare, the, um, um, you know, to use some of the skills that we're going to use in a little bit. So we do a couple of things before we read that get us started with our target word, that get us ready to talk um, and to interact around the story. And then as we read, get into actual reading, we're doing lots of different things, as you can see here. And the focus all the way through is to give them lots of core word input and elicit it back from them frequently throughout the activity, right? Because language learning uh, works best when it's active, right? It's not a great spectator sport, right? So we're getting interactive. We're getting playful with stories and props, right? Who thinks we should act it out? I do. Who wants to be the cow? I do. Who wants something else? I do, right? We've kind of tweaked the kinds of questions we're asking, the kinds of statements we make, so that we can both model and elicit lots of those high-frequency words, right? Now, after reading, we build on, um, uh, you know, we want to continue building their knowledge, uh, both about core vocabulary, um, story concepts, um, uh, concepts of prints and print and all of that. So that was a, really a quick look, but um, we've kind of mapped out a sequence of 10 lessons, and we sort of scripted it out a bit to give you a sense of what it might look and feel like. Right? But don't interpret this like a script, like a play, right? More like a sample, an example of how someone might go through these activities, right? And this was a little bit of a challenge for us, right? We tried to find that balance between enough detail so teachers really get a sense um, of what to do and, you know, on the other end of the continuum, kind of a cookbook approach, which we really didn't want, right? I don't think, you know, most teachers like that. I know, you know, my use of cookbooks have evolved um, in the years I've been cooking, right? When I first um, start, was on my own, I started a cooking. I bought a lot of cookbooks, right? I had a lot of them, and I used them to make what shopping lists, and I followed them step by step, right? But after a while, I kind of got the hang of cooking, right? I got some technique down. I was able to predict how different ingredients would respond in different conditions, right? And so I didn't really need cookbooks in the same way anymore, right? And now that um, I use them more for ideas, but not so much, you know, a step-by-step -step prescription for, for what to do. And that's kind of what we were going for here. And you'll have to tell us to what extent uh, we achieved that. All right, so in the end, it's all about language. And I'm going to perseverate on this, at this point, but hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll indulge me in that way. I will say that um, we did create 
um, um, a number of self-check forms that teachers can use in the reflecting teachers teaching practices, right? Because lessons one through 10 are different, the forms are going to be different too, right? So each lesson has a corresponding self-check form that they can use or not use as they see, see fit. And I'll talk a little bit more about those um, uh, later on. But just so you know, those are in there. All right, so let's think next about um, kind of the second component, our um, uh, shared writing component. And as we said before, it's all about the language. As much as we love all the experiences it gives them with this literacy activity and introduces them to different kinds of authentic writing, right, as much as we love that, it really is here mostly as a context for us to do lots and lots of good input and output with our high-frequency words. So many of you are very familiar with shared writing um, and the way that we've kind of operationalized it is built on the structured language experience approach by Patricia Cunningham. And um, we've, we've really operationalized sh shared writing and tell me in a very particular way, right? Um, we use predictable chart writing as a way to engage the kids around a writing experience right, um, that's engineered to build their awareness and use of this high-frequency vocabulary. So the teacher chooses a topic and a structure or a predictable pattern for the kids to follow, and then together, right, the teacher and the children compose that text with the teacher supporting and writing as the children are dictating. Now, that's not what it looks like in second grade, but it sure is what it looks like in preschool, right? And then once that chart is initially created together, they're going to do lots of other things with it, right? So they might take different forms, right? It might just be on one big piece of chart paper. It might be on sentence strips, right, depending on what lesson you're on and depending on the personal preference of um, um, the teacher, okay? All right, so, so preschool is, at a is a time where we're still very much in problem-solving mode with these kids, right, um, with our AAC kiddos, right? We almost never have it all figured out right from the start of the school year. So how a child is going to dictate his or her response may certainly change as we learn more and more about him and keep refining that AAC set of tools that he's using. So one of the things I will say is don't feel like you have to wait until you get a really great AAC system in place, right? That's a bit of a moving target to put <laughs> it mildly in preschool. Use what you have and just keep building on it to improve on it. I would say don't defer your instruction even though you feel like, you know, you don't have anywhere near a perfect AAC system. Remember that perfect is the enemy of the good. Right? So get started with what you have um, and, um, uh, you know, work that core vocabulary into the shared classroom communication devices, the low-tech stuff that you have available, um, their personal speech generating devices, um, and, you know, so, some choice boards that you might have to make specifically for the activity, right? So an example that I have here, their core vocabulary right, might be in the um, shared classroom communication device or their personal speech generating device. And then there's a choice board that um, covers, that they will use to dictate what their response is in the pool, at camp, uh, in bed, that kind of thing. All right, so. Shared writing like shared reading is done daily in groups, right? Same thing every day, except that each day has a bit of a different focus. The same three parts, before writing, writing, and after writing, right? Some things stay the same in lessons one through 10, others change, right? You should be starting to see a pattern because that's exactly how it went down with shared reading. 
right? So 10 lessons in sequential order, and they're somewhat scripted, but see the scripts more as examples rather than things that you are supposed to say exactly as they are written. And the bottom line, as I'll keep saying, <laughs> is that it's all about the language, right? As much fun and learning happens around the writing, we're in it to teach them to use those high-frequency words. All right, so that it, it really is that repetition with variety that helps us get more and more fluent with these strategies. And like we said with shared reading, shared writing it, lessons are different one through ten. So each self um, rating form, that check-in form, is uh, different as well. Each one has its corresponding form. All right. So Tell Me has two sets of group lessons around each book, right? And they're designed to be done with the kids daily in the order we presented them, although we certainly respect and recognize the need for any individual teacher to modify it based on her kids and the way she runs her classroom. Um, but most of what happens in preschool classrooms is much more informal, right? It's much less structured. Right? And so this next component allows us to take advantage of existing routines and activities and tweak them to make them a bit more powerful in teaching the four to six core words that go along with the book we read in shared reading and the topic we're writing about in shared writing. So unlike shared reading and writing, the implementation suggestions that we've provided um, in this component are not designed to be completed in chronological order, right? So if you think about of shared reading and writing lessons, they're kind of set up like a meal at a fancy restaurant where the server first brings you maybe an appetizer or a salad and then maybe your entree and following that dessert, right? It's kind of linear, right? Lessons one, two, three, all the way up to 10. For this component, it's much more like that buffet style restaurant, right? where you're going to go up to the spread, and you look over the main dishes, you look at the side dishes, you look at the salad bar items, you look at the dessert bar, right? And you choose what you want to take, how much of it, right? And, and when you're going to take that particular thing. So let's talk about integrating core word practice throughout the preschool day, really, which is what this component is designed to do, right? Uh, it really has dozens of ideas for how teachers and paraprofessionals and the therapists who push into the classroom can make core vocabulary an active presence throughout the day, right? So we purposely built in lots of flexibilities, right? You guys who are teachers, those of you who have been in classrooms, you know, teachers are very different one from another. They have different personalities and routines and teaching styles and preferences. Some teachers don't like cooking at all. Some teachers cook two or three times a week. Right? So we're trying not to tell them what activities to do, but to give them ideas and templates for ways to work in core vocabulary that go along with the book they're reading that week if they do those activities. All right, so almost every preschool that I've been in does some form of morning meeting or circle time, and we've given some suggestions for how to tweak that. Um, uh, to boost those learning opportunities for the four to six words that we're focusing on um, uh, with this particular um, book. Uh, they almost all go outside for part of the day, and many teachers have told us that they struggle with how to make this productive um, in terms of learning bond, maybe the gross motor and play experiences that they already offer. Um, so what we did was create some simple activities that they could do uh, during the time that um, they're outside, so that children are seeing and hearing the adults use core words with the AC systems, right? And so that teachers, paraprofessionals, speech language pathologists, they're slowing down and purposely creating opportunities for kids to use the new words they're learning, right? So tell me includes suggestions and specific guidance for how to do that. Bunch of different activities. I think one of my favorites is this little kind of scavenger hunt activity where the kids are looking for core word um, symbols that have been hidden, right? And they're using those words as they look for them and find them and scream in delight as they found them. And we, I've, I've seen teachers do this in really creative ways. So uh, in one classroom, they would send an aide and two of the kids ahead of time 
ahead of the rest of the group so that the three of them um, could kind of hide the core symbols on the path to the recess yard. They were kind of hiding them in plain sight, but that's how it goes, right? Um, um, and then when the rest of the, cl the class came along, they'd look for those hidden symbols. So whether the kids were in the first group or the second group, they still saw a lot adults using those core words, right? They still got the opportunity to say them. They still got a lot of AAC input and a lot of AAC output um, in a focused way. Um, Okay, so um, let's move on to snack time. Um, lots of your rooms have snack time as well, and if AEC is used in a preschool, it's almost always used at snack time. But what we wanted to do with snack time is not work on requesting and choice making. Teachers and therapists already have that. They don't need any help with that. They're already good at that. We wanted to dip our little toe into the world of communicating for other reasons and begin to develop conversational skills that will allow them to be more social during mealtimes because across cultures, meals are a very, very social experience. And so the way that we sort of operationalized this was with a concept called quick quack questions. Now, this isn't going to make them stellar conversationalists, but hang with me for a minute um, and you'll kind of get the idea. The idea is that we have a question of the day and the, um, either in the asking the question or in answering it, the idea is that everybody will get core vocabulary exposure and expressive practice. So the question of the day might be, and you might stick with the question and keep it all week, the question might be who has fruit in their snack today, right? And we can say things like, I do. And so whether we're asking the question, we have core vocabulary in the question, or whether we're answering the question, we're answering it with core vocabulary. So like I said, it's not going to make them, you know, stellar conversationalists, but it gives us enough structure to manage um, non-behavior um, regulation communication during a snack time activity. All right, uh, classrooms have many different kinds of activities and centers, and so we've provided, you know, dozens of suggestions for different activities for things you're probably already doing, like this one's a, um, ideas for a theme table. And you can see here again, we've given some scripted examples as examples right, not because we want you to be robots or saying exactly what this says, but just so you have a sense of what you're going for, right? And in this particular example, you see some of the words are highlighted in yellow. That means they're words that go along with this particular book. If they're highlighted in blue, it means we covered these in a previous book. But once we move on, we don't forget about the words that we um, used earlier, right? We want to keep those alive. It takes our kids way more than two weeks to get any level um, uh, of fluency with these words. All right, so it might be a dramatic play center, right? Um, dramatic play core vocabulary style, right? Who wants to be it, right? I do, what should we tell them? Go away, right? So um, it might be um, a pretend play. Uh, it might be an art activity, right? Art's a great activity for language building, and I think teachers already are doing a great job of having kids request what they need, uh, learn colors, right? But with a little shift in mindset, we can also use these same activities to provide that focused language stimulation and elicitation on target pronouns and verbs and prepositions and descriptors and so forth. So Tell Me has suggested art activities that go along with the book and are also well suited to the four to six words that we're working on at the moment. So we're so grateful to the creative team at Attainment for the amazing job they did uh, really in developing um, these visual instructions and making the templates that teachers can print and use and really all the wonderful graphics um, and to my terrific colleague Lori who came up with uh, these amazing ideas. 
Um, app connections, more and more of you are using mobile devices and um, in your classrooms already. And so uh, Lori uh, came up with uh, some of the ones that are free and very low cost that teachers are already using or may want to use. Lots of them are free. Um, in April, Autism Awareness Month, and in October, AAC Awareness Month. Um, there's often cost reductions and things go free for a while. Um, but how can we use these and integrate some of the core vocabulary practice for the four to six words we're thinking about uh, this particular week? But if apps aren't your thing or you don't do a lot of art in your classroom, right, don't worry. There's plenty more ideas for you. Um, each book has specific suggestions for uh, the activity uh, categories we already discussed, the ones on this particular slide. And our teaching, you know, our thinking really was let's set this buffet table with a wide array uh, of, of uh, you know, tempting dishes. Let teachers and therapists help themselves to the things that fit their personalities, their preference, their routines, um, and their kids. All right, so there's also a self-check form for implementation so that in any point a teacher could reflect on his or her teaching practices, see what they're doing well, what they might want to further develop, and I've heard from, you know, uh, some classrooms about how they use this in interesting ways. Um, one of them, for example, uses it with her paraprofessionals. Um, the teaching assistants reflect on their experience, then uh, they fill it out. Um, and I don't even think they give it to the teacher. They just use it to tell the teacher what areas they think they need more support on. And then the teacher does maybe a mini training at the end of the day. And it might only be five minutes or models it for them or co-teaches it with them, coaches them the next time, whatever she sees appropriate. I really love that idea. Um, I heard from a couple of teachers who say they're the only classroom in their building with kids that have significant disabilities. And one in particular uh, told me early on how she was kind of constantly getting dinged by her principal evaluating her because, um, you know, she was do not doing things the same way as teachers who had less involved kids. Um, so then she began to show the self-check form to her principal, kind of as a way of saying, look, this is my target, this is what I'm trying to do, measure me according to this rubric. And now, you know, when an administrator kind of comes in to do a walkthrough and evaluation, the teacher just pulls out the check form that kind of goes with the lesson or infusion activity she's doing. Um, and that's used to help the principal or whomever know what to look for, right? And I've heard this from, from an SLP as well. So um, they're much happier with the outcomes uh, when they uh, have this kind of approach because it's just, you know, a very different kind of metric than what our administrators might be looking for. All right. So the final component relates to family involvement, right? It was designed to give teachers a relatively quick and easy way to help families be informed, build their AC knowledge, and hopefully, uh, in some cases, help them support language in AAC use at home when that's feasible. So every week, there's a share packet that teachers print out and send home with their family, right? And it contains these things. Right, information about which book we're reading, what the set of core words is, what the letter is that we're focusing on, some information about supportive strategies that the families can use, um, suggestions for specific activities and how to incorporate our target words, um, ideas for uh, using that target words with uh, free low-cost um, educational and recreational apps. A lot of parents are asking that for these days. Uh, it also includes the symbols for the core words, um, a note from the teacher, and then kind of some feedback that comes back from the families, right, in a perfect world. We all know how that goes. So here's just an example um, of a little, you know, one page from well, one of the share packets that, you know, is far, fairly far along in the program, you can see, because a lot of core words have already been covered. Right, and um, they're just a couple of pages, like I said, that teachers um, print out and share with their families. Um, now, some of the activity suggestions are things that the kids have already done with you in the classroom, and that can be super helpful because the kid already has a little familiarity with it. 
right? And we know that that's going to help the activity go a little more smoothly, help the parents feel more successful, make it more enjoyable, um, and things like that. And then this is just a quick peek at um, uh, some of the, the one on the top is the, the note home that the teacher would fill out for um, that particular child. And then the parent report kind of thing uh, is the one on the bottom that comes back. Okay. So I've seen uh, classroom teams do amazing things in addition to this, um, creating materials, but this is uh, what we have to send home each week for the parents that are involved, whose kids are involved with the Tell Me program. So that kind of takes us through the four components, but before I let you go, I just want to highlight one other piece. Every one of the book packets has a sizable appendix, and in the appendix, or some time-saving tool. And one popular resource is um, the symbol cards for the core words that go along with this particular book, right? We are so grateful to those who granted permission to tell me to include um, Smarty symbols and Pixon and PCS. And of course, to the graphic artists at Attainment who did an amazing job with drawing the manual signs that represent those words. So obviously, you would use whichever ones correspond with the symbols that your kids' AEC systems have, right, and just print those from the flash drive, right? Or you may, may have to make your own if your students need a different kind of symbol set that we weren't given permission uh, to use, right? So it's, I'm not saying it's comprehensive by any means, but we did want to include some resources to get you started, right? But there are lots more um, resources in the, that appendix material, letter, car letter cards for alphabet work, a template for an alphabet book for the letter that goes along with that book, game materials, recipes, um, templates for art, right? Again, big props to attainment team for making these so teacher friendly um, and adorable. All right, so as we wrap up, you can view Really Tell Me, I think, um, as a framework that can be replicated by teams who want to include more AAC and specifically more high frequency or core vocabulary throughout the day. It's really our hope that once they get familiar with these procedures, with the strategies, the teams can work together to meet their own needs for what has to happen in their classroom um, in core vocabulary instruction, right? Their own books with their own sets of words, with the AAC system that their kids use. Um, and we're hoping that they can, uh, you know, fairly easily extrapolate what they've learned through these 11 books over 22 weeks to the kinds of things that work uh, in their classrooms. So I know that there were a number of questions. I couldn't quite keep up with them. Uh, but um, Lisa, uh, I will kind of turn it over to you. Maybe you can point me in the direction to the ones that we need to address in the time that I've left um, here. Uh, but before we do that, I just did want to point you to where you can get additional information. Uh, on the attainment website, there are three tabs where they have tell me details, additional information, and samples and support. And if you go to this URL and click on the Samples and Support tab, you can download the three PDFs that um, I'm showing you there, okay? So um, uh, feel free to explore that. All right, so Lisa, this is probably a good time for us to do some questions. Okay, number one question, um, people want to know if you will share their, your slides. Oh, sure, I will be happy to do that. I will make, I, you know, I can't stop tweaking things, so I made a new version of it at 4.45 this morning. But I will make a handout version, and um, Saltillo has been very generous at, in allowing me to post the archived uh, version of this talk on my website, which I will do next week. And um, I will share the handout there, and I will also share it um, with, at, with the Saltillo folks so they can post it on their site as well. But if you, uh, so you can look for it in either place um, as of uh, next Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is that um, she said, I heard you mention a classroom AAC, AAC tool. I've seen this. Can you talk more? Does this interfere with students who have other systems? 
Okay, so I'm going to make an assumption here. Um, oh, thank you, Krupa. <laughs> I'm going to make a, an assumption here, and that is by a classroom AAC tool. There are some classrooms that um, have decided to go with an approach where they have a very large um, uh, communication display that is generally core vocabulary focused and um, has, you know, um, a, a starter set, a un, well, you know, what some schools call a universal core. Um, and then in that classroom, there's one of a couple of things happening. Either every kid is on a system that uses that exact layout or on a system that uses those symbols. Um, or um, uh, they uh, have some kids on alternative symbols and alternative systems, and then um, that gets more complicated. So this is one of those tricky situations. Um, so let's just talk about it for a minute more. Here's been my experience. We know how important it is to individualize for these kids' needs, right? We get that. They are all very different, right? Here's the downside, right? If you've been a teacher of kids with four or five different systems and you're trying to learn and support those four or five systems, you know that it is terribly stressful and challenging and your implementation probably isn't as strong as you want it to be. So my experience has been when you have multiple systems in a classroom, the implementation is a little shaky because we are trying to do good intervention with four or five different things, right? And that is awfully tough to do, right? To be that knowledgeable, that four or five different systems to be able to teach it, right? So other people say, okay, you know, I'm not doing so well with that. Let me try a different approach. So they're starting with more of a universal system, getting fluent with the procedures and the processes that we know to be supportive, like aided language input, like non-directive talking, right, like responsive um, feedback, like creating frequent communication opportunities that are non-confrontational, right, and they get good at all of that and then do a little bit of a reset and say, okay, now that I figured out all these strategies, now let's go back and individualize the AAC systems. So does that help with that question at all, Lisa? I think so. I think Great. very much so. Uh, somebody said just the best yeah. answer. So, yep. Um, someone asked if, there, if you plan to publish in more languages. Um, no, we really don't, and um, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, the most uh, important one probably is that we try to build this around trade books and books that are already in your school library, if not in your classrooms already. So the books we use probably don't have the cultural relevance um, that would be needed for classrooms in India or Brazil or Singapore. Okay. Uh, one more question, and then we'll wrap it up, and I'll send you the other questions. So there, sure. um, you have a parent asking um, about this being obviously directed at educators with some parent homework built in. By chance, is there a Tell Me program specific to parents? Funny you should ask. <laughs> People often ask, how can you scale this up and do it in a bigger way? And I often think to myself, how can you scale this down and get it to the point where individual families and clinicians can use it if they don't have influence over an entire classroom? And so that's something very much of interest to us. Um, and um, I'm hoping um, that we have an exciting year ahead. We're going to be piloting this with um, a small group of homeschooling uh, families and some individuals, clinicians, um, in order to uh, see if that seems like a feasible and valuable thing to do. Ooh, so stay tuned. That's <laughs> exciting. Uh, so I will wrap it up now. It's the top of the end of the hour. And so we want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Zangari, this was wonderful information. Thank you for being our guest and for sharing your wonderful information. And we hope that you'll follow Satilo on the social media.
uh, channels and hope that you have a great weekend. We'll follow up with some of those other questions uh, to the group that attended. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, everybody. And thank you, Saltello. Thank you.